Hi everyone, welcome to the 2021 Plant PopNet Participants Workshop. So I hope you're going to enjoy the series of videos that we've recorded for you um, with just updates on our progress over the last couple of years. Our last participants um, workshop was in 2017, which seems like a, almost a lifetime ago now with everything that's happened in between. But uh, we have some really exciting updates to tell you about and hopefully there'll be lots of new ideas and discussions at this workshop which will contribute to the next few years work. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my presentation here and get started. Okay, so just a quick recap of the history of the network. Um, originally, the idea was posed amongst a group of us in St. Lucy's Bar at the University of Queensland in 2012. And the first steering meeting was um, held at Trinity College Dublin in 2014, around about March. First data were collected in 20, well, some pilot data were collected in 2013, and then it, it got underway in, in earnest in 2014. And we had our first participants conference in 2017. The first plant popnet data using year zero data, so this is demographic data from the whole network, was the Smith et al. Uh, 2020 PNAS paper on uh, genetic diversity and demography. The second plant popnet paper using year zero data was the Villela et al. paper in 2021 published in Ecology Letters just this year. And that was using um, uh, year zero demographic data together with glass house and field uh, data on traits as well as demography. Now the first standard data product, and you're gonna hear a lot about these standard data products in my talk and in Alan Finn's talk today, uh, that's available now for participants to take a look at in our shared data folder. So that's an exciting milestone for us. And with um, other uh, standard data products will be added to that folder very shortly indeed. And then this, this is the second participants conference, which is taking place this year. So it's exciting to see the progression um, over that time period. And we are now at my latest count anyway, up to about 74 different data contributors. If you can't find your name on this list, please uh, do get in touch with me um, as soon as possible and with your, with your site name and where you should be listed. And we'll make sure that your name goes into our master data sheet. But it's a fantastic uh, group of people, some, some uh, people I know and some people I don't know, but um, I'm delighted to have you all within the network and it's fantastic to have your data continuing to come in. And this is just, this is actually a slide that was made for the 2017 participants um, um, conference. And it just includes some of your faces. Um, I, I didn't have time to put together a slide of all 74 data contributors. And this is what's happening at Plan Popner HQ at the moment. So this is um, my lab at Trinity. Uh, and these are the people in my lab who are involved in Plan Popnet projects. And you'll be seeing these people during the conference. So I thought it'd be useful for you to and put faces to names. So Alan Finn, you've all corresponded with Alan um, and he's in charge of the data curation um, and also involved in, in the field protocol. Maud Baudraz is a PhD student just coming to the end of her PhD now and she's been looking at uh, uh, species distribution modeling. She set up her own mini plant pop net in the Swiss Alps with 18 sites called Plant Alp Resch, and you'll hear more about that in Maud's talk and she's been looking at trait variation across her plant Alpresh network, as well as looking at modeling, uh, building the first population models for both plant Alpresh as a kind of a pilot proof of concept, um, and then also for the global plant PopNet data as well. And Javier Puy uh, joined us about a year ago, and he's a postdoc, and he's particularly interested in herbivory and clonality. And Javi will, uh, you'll see a talk from him as well on the list, so you'll see what he's been up to. And Javi has, and Alan have been um, helping to organize this week's conference. So thanks to them. So this is just a figure, I guess, showing a little bit um, where we currently are in terms of our data. So the world map above shows the location of plant pop net demographic sites. And some of those have a little yellow insert, which is where we have genomic data that Annabelle Smith used in her paper. Um, the pink uh, color in this map indicates the native range and the blue indicates the non-native range. Um, and then down here we have the Whitaker biomes plot. And again, you can see the same. So the, the pink smear 
And the blue smear here are just GBIF data points just showing the, the location of uh, plant popnet occurrences. Um, and then these circles are where we have our plant popnet demographic sites. So you can see we're reasonably well distributed um, in space and we're very well distributed throughout the, dem throughout, sorry, the occupancy niche of Plantago lanceolata. So these circles here are plant popnet sites and the bigger the circle, the more years of data. The pink ones are the native range sites and the purple ones are the non-native range sites. And you can see against this background again of the GBIF points that we are, our demographic sites are quite well distributed through this space. And in fact, with, with some sites falling outside of the, the Whittaker biomes. So um, um, that's interesting in itself, high precip cold site here. Um, so, but a question actually was raised when I had um, a few members of the network look at the Plant PopNet Methods paper and a version of this figure was shown. And this is something for a discussion is, are we happy with this level of uh, representation of the niche of Plantago lanceolata? So for example, we have very little here in the Midwest of the US. Um, we don't have anything out here into Central Asia, which could be quite an important part of Plantago's niche because it's kind of on, on, on a niche edge in the, in the native range. Um, and you know, we still don't have any, any African sites down here or um, anything in the way of South America where there are a few sites with Plantago scattered through there. So are we happy with this? Is this something we need to expand? I mean, it's kind of symptomatic of um, some of the issues with, with uh, North America and Europe being over and Austra Australasia being overrepresented in global data sets in general. Um, so I think that's, that's a useful discussion point. It's great the way that the, the plant popnet data set has developed, um, though with the co-occurrence of the demographic and genomic data, which Annabel made use of, um, with uh, this uh, glasshouse data from Jesus Villelas's work, and, and then we haven't really exploited our field data, our community data plots yet much as well. So we have we have data from the lab, the field and, and, and genomic data all together, which adds a lot of value. So that's where we are graphically. Now, what I wanted to do in this talk was just give some updates around the science of what's happening in Plant PopNet, the governance of how we run the network, um, updates on the data, and you'll find out in a lot more detail um, uh, the data issues from Alan's talk, and then just chatting about the future. And the idea of this talk is really just to set us up for the discussion sessions, which are going to happen later on in the workshop. So with regards to the science, we can talk about updates in terms of papers published, the pipeline of work that's coming through, and the progress against um, what we uh, set out to do right at the start. In terms of governance, I can talk about the steering committee and funding, and we can uh, discuss more any, any other aspects of governance that you like in the discussion sessions later on. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the standard data product releases um, and what we have and what we uh, are planning for the future. And then I want to talk about the future of the network, its sustainability and its longevity. So I'll start with the science updates. Uh, there's been three uh, really nice recent Plant PopNet publications. Annabelle Smith led the Global Gene Flow um, paper in PNAS. Um, Melanie Morales um, and Sergei Monebosch led the, um, um, the paper on oxidative stress. So this was on a subset of Plant PopNet sites. So it's our first add-on project that's been published. So there's um, a uh, uh, only a limited number of plant popnet participants involved in this paper because only a limited number of sites took part in it. Um, but that was uh, really nice to see that out. And then Jesus Villelas's paper again was on the core plant popnet data. So many of you are authors on this one. Um, um, and this was the one on phenotypic plasticity and genetic differentiation for vegetative and reproductive traits. And that used um, the common garden experiment as well as the the field data for year zero. So um, really nice um, publications and I hope that they'll get a reasonable amount of attention over the over the coming um, months and years. Now there's a pipeline of planned abstracts and you can get access to these. I'm not going to run through them all in this talk because I think it would be um, much better if you just took a look at this um, inventory of abstracts and it's available in the, on the Plant PopNet website, in the password protected section of the website um, called data. So it's here. Um, so if you click on home, or sorry, um, 
uh, the network, if you click on the network, sorry, then this, this little menu comes up, meet the team data and workshop. If you click on data, you get taken to that password protected page. And from there, you can get access to the shared Google Docs folder. And in there, you'll see this inventory of plant pop net abstracts and add-ons. And the color coding here just gives you a quick visual way of seeing uh, what's what. The green ones are pretty much done. The yellow ones are well advanced. The red ones are stopped for various reasons. And the white, one, the white ones are underway. So um, please do have a look at that and bring up any issues that you have um, in the discussion sessions or feel free to email us. So for the science updates, I wanted to just quickly go through our original Plant PopNet core questions. So you can find these on the website. Um, the first question was, what are the environmental and biological drivers of population persistence and extinction? The second question was around, how are the global patterns in life history schedules influenced by the environment? The third question was, what is the demographic function of functional traits? And the fourth question is, how do traits in demography vary in native and non-native ranges? Okay, so let's go with the first question. What are the environmental and biological drivers of population persistence and extinction? So a lot of this work is still underway. Um, Maud, uh, Maud Baudraz has been um, uh, leading this work as part of her PhD with um, huge contributions from Ruth Kelly and Anna Chergo uh, and lots of other collaborators, um, including people outside of the Plant PopNet network. And Maud will tell you much more about that um, in her uh, in her talks. So she's looking at building climatic suitability models, both for her, well, she has built climatic suitability models, both for, both for her plant albrecht selection of 18 sites in the Swiss Alps along a very steep altitudinal gradient and for the global plant pop net um, data itself. And she's also built matrix population models for both plant albrecht and for the global plant pop net data set. So this is a huge advance. And she's now looking at how the suitability models interface with those demographic rates in different ways. So she's going to tell you about that, but that's um, uh, explicitly answering that first question. Uh, the second uh, thing that we're working on in the lab is um, herbivory as a driver of demography. And this is an exciting new collaboration which we have put in place with Herbvar, which is another uh, globally distributed team science project looking at variation in herbivory worldwide. And they have nominated Plantago lanceolata as one of their focal species. The rest of their, their project is, is very broad and it covers a whole range of different species all over the world. But they have a few focal species where they're looking at within species variation in herbivory. And you might remember that we called for um, uh, people to volunteer their sites for an add-on uh, looking at uh, herbivory. So we have included the Herbvar protocol and we've trialed it at, at several plant PopNet sites now and Javi's going to tell you more about that. And we'll be using that to look at how herbivory influences the vital rates and demography as part of Javi's postdoc. Also as part of that um, project, um, we've been lucky enough to kind of team up um, an add-on on clonality together with a, an experimental test of what happens when you remove leaves from plant PopNet sorry, from Plantago lanceolata plants. So um, as part of the clonality work, um, uh, leaves were removed from plants and we can look at the impact of that on the vital rates as a surrogate for herbivory itself. And then there's another project going on again. Javi is leading this at the moment, but it's um, being done very much in collaboration with Glenda Wardle, Annabel Smith and Stephanie Chen. And it's looking at uh, the incidence of clonality across environmental gradients within the plant pop net uh, data set. So some of you again have kindly contributed to this add-on and Javi will um, shortly be sending those uh, leaves for processing for the genomics. And he can tell you more about that in his talk. So there's good progress going on against that first question. The second question we posed was, how are global patterns in life history schedules influenced by the environment? And again, Maud Baudraz, because she has built the first um, matrix population models, and this has been in collaboration with uh, Dylan Childs and myself, obviously, um, looking at, um, so she's built the demographic models and she's calculated some life history metrics from those demographic models. And she's now looking at the variation in life history. And again, Maud can tell you more about that in her talk. 
The third question is around what is the demographic function of functional traits? Um, so there's been work going on um, on this. Obviously, Jesus Villelas' um, project looks at variation in functional traits and how they vary um, uh, through across environmental gradients and in native and non-native ranges. So we have a, a good understanding now of trait variation throughout the range. Um, Maud has also been looking at um, functional traits in her plant Albrecht system um, and looking at how those functional traits vary as a function of climatic suitability. Um, as well. So we're getting a better and better understanding of the variation of functional traits within Plantago. And then across multiple species, this is not part of the Plant PopNet project, but it's it's relevant. And um, this is a nice paper by Ruth Kelly, one of our participants, uh, again published just this year. Um, and this proposes a new modeling framework for connecting functional traits with life history strategy. And it's not yet been implemented within species, so it's not been implemented for the Plant PopNet data, but it opens up the intriguing concept of being able to do that um, in a really nice integrated way. Um, and this will be part of uh, what's well, a grant application that's under review at the moment of mine um, um, about extending this um, approach and uh, to Plantago lanceolata as well. And then the, the next question, how do traits in demography vary in native and non-native ranges? Uh, Jesus's paper is being critical for this, but also Annabelle's paper looking at genetic diversity and how that correlates across um, correlates with environmental gradients and also demographic rates um, across the native and non-native ranges. And some really interesting results have come out of both of these that shed a bit of light on, on that. So what I would say from this is that we've made a really good start at answering these questions, but the questions themselves are quite large and quite multi-dimensional. So I think that it's not a case of these questions are now done and dusted. There's many ways that they can be approached. And I hope now with the standard data products as a good starting point, as a jump off point, we can start to propose more um, granular abstracts in the space of these big um, four big questions where we start to, to, to hive off um, sub questions from this and um, broaden participation um, across the network in terms of leading um, projects in this space. But there's, these are just four questions. Uh, even if we have a bunch of sub-questions sitting underneath, I think there's lots of scope for additional questions to be asked with the data that we've now compiled. So again, I really hope that those kinds of discussions will start in, in or continue in this workshop, in the sessions on um, um, Wednesday and Thursday about how we can start to pursue additional um, questions. And that's exciting. Okay, so then moving on to the governance. This is our current steering committee. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that everyone seems reasonably happy to stay on at the moment. But if there's, if you'd like to see changes in steering committee, if anyone would like to step down or people want to step up, um, just let me know um, and we can discuss that in, in our governance section. Um, or if you have suggestions for how the steering committee can better can work better, um, again, we, I'm very happy to, to take questions on that in the discussion. And we have several members of the steering committee um, attending those sessions as well. So we'd all love to hear your opinions on how we can make this work better. Um, funding is obviously a, a core issue for the network and, and what we can do. So just a review of the network level funding um, over the past few years. So funding really commenced with a Marie Curie Actions Grant um, in 2013 and about 15K of that supported um, the initial steps. Um, to get the, getting the network off the ground. Um, the first substantial funding was the Science Foundation Ireland grant, um, which ran from 2015 to 2018 and funded um, Annabelle's work and Jesus's work, um, which carried on past the end of that grant. And about half of that grant was dedicated to Plant Pop Network. Um, then there's been an Irish Research Council grant to myself um, from 2017 to 2022. So this originally ran to um, the middle of 2022, and I think I'll be able to extend it to the end of 2022. And around 350k of that has been dedicated to Plant PopNet. And both the Science Foundation Ireland and the IRC grants have really helped to, well, they have fully funded our data curation over the past um, six years. And that's been huge as well as funding some of the, the postdocs um, and PhD student work that's gone on. 
sorry, I'll just flick back. So um, there's also a question of where, where is the future? Where is the next tranche of money coming from? Um, and this is, you know, the, the, what, what the network really, really needs, um, you know, as a, to have a stable core is this strong data curation element. Um, now I've applied for an ERC advance grant, which would be five years of money. Um, that is an unlikely um, outcome. Um, so we know that these are, are very hard grants to get. And um, so I'm not uh, counting on it for sure. Nobody should count on this one. Um, and it's under review at the moment. And the outcome is either due in December, if it gets kicked out in the first round, or um, April 2022, if there is um, a positive or negative outcome at that, at that point. So we will know approximately um, eight or nine months before the end of the funding, um, the, the current round of funding, whether we have continuing funding or not. Um, so this is a risk. Um, we don't know whether we're going to have data curation funding past 20, the end of 2022. And that's something we do need to discuss about how we go forward um, because grant applications will need to start now um, uh, to fund the, the data curation. If somebody else wants to have a go at trying to fund that, um, that would be fantastic um, uh, given the uncertainty of, of getting an ERC. So we can discuss that more in the, in the sessions. And then obviously all of you have had um, either have been doing this um, out of the goodness of your own heart and scraps that you can find around the place or you've had um, individual site level funding to enable you to do this work. Um, and I know most of you are doing this on the side at weekends involving um, all of your family. I think that this concept of the shadow network, our mothers, brothers, sisters, fathers, uncles, aunts, grannies, um, and all the various other people that we rope in to help us out on our annual field work. Um, are greatly appreciated and it's an under underappreciated and unsung contribution to the network. Um, we've tried to quantify un, unfunded time in various ways for the Plant Popnet Methods paper, but I think that shadow network is something that that we haven't tried to uh, ha haven't tried to grasp. So I, I know from my own experience, my mother has been my research assistant for the last two years because I haven't been able to bring anyone else out in the field with me during COVID. Um, so I, I commend her um, patience for sitting in a field for two days, writing down numbers. Um, okay, so that's the funding part of governance. Um, in our shared folders, so again, if you can access these from the Plant PopNet website. We have various govern governance documents in there around authorship, around uh, declaration of funding, um, around the abstract submission, if you have an idea for a paper, um, and a general network governance document and a data management document. And you're very, very welcome. And, and please, I'd encourage you to go and read these um, governance documents because now is the time to propose changes, additions, deletions, and perhaps there's a piece of governance that you think um, is missing from, from our documents. We need to have a policy about it. Um, so I'd be very, very open um, to having those conversations in the discussions. Okay, so data updates. Now, Alan's talk will give you lots of detail on this, but the broad brush is that we have now produced standard data products from year zero to year three, and these will be available to participants within the network, so not publicly available yet. Um, the year zero data is currently in the shared data folder, which you can access from the website, and the others will be added shortly. So we're just seeing how the system works with the year zero data before we um, put the other data products on there. Um, and it's very important that we keep these data products within the network as much, uh, well, completely at the moment, because there are people working on um, uh, papers, there are PhD students who rely on, on getting their thesis out, rely on this data for getting their thesis out. Um, it's, it's very important that we keep these um, data sets within the network. So please don't share them, they're for us only. Um, so that's that's that, and you'll, I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but I just wanted to mention as well here that I'm working on with Alan uh, primarily, but also with contributions from Glenda and Debbie and Elizabeth and a whole bunch of other people, Jesus has contributed um, to a plant PopNet methods paper. Um, and this will include details of the data production, so production of the standard data products, and will include publication of the year zero standard data product. So once that paper has been submitted, we'll submit the year zero standard data product with it. And this will then release that standard data product to the public, which I think is really, really important. And it basically is the start of us releasing um, data products into the wild um, into, to the ecological community at large. 
Now, we we are a little bit careful about how we do that because we want to make sure that the participants get a chance to publish first um, on our on our data products. So that's why we're slow about releasing to the general public. But the intention is um, once we have our year zero out there, we start, we will then, you know, we'll release in the future, we'll release the year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, et cetera, um, gradually um, part, bit by bit as we as we publish. Now, obviously, data are um, published together with papers. So when papers um, are published these days, um, they almost always have a data set that goes with them. And that derived data set, rather than the standard data product that sits behind it, is published with the paper. But it's really important, I think, that the standard data products are also published because that helps with the reproducibility of um, the work that's being done. Okay, so why did we produce these standard data products and what are they? Well, you'll find out what they are if you listen to Alan's talk. Um, and they've taken, they've taken us a long time to produce. So they represent an awful lot of work uh, going from the raw data which is submitted and with projects of this size and of this nature, there are always, no matter how well people follow the protocol, um, there will always be errors in the data sets that get submitted to us. And there will be inconsistencies in the way that people have interpreted particular columns or particular instructions in the protocol. So that led to um, problems in comparing data sets across sites. Um, and we wanted to try and avoid those problems so make, make the whole data set as usable as possible um, by standardizing the, the, the data sets. The other reason we wanted to produce these standard data products was because we realized even within my own group, that data cleaning processes from person to person varied a lot. Um, and there was the potential for conflicts to arise um, comparing one set of results with another set of results um, that could arise just because of differences in data cleaning. And those aren't often very obvious. You have to really dig and, and often they aren't um, well documented, how you go from raw data to the data product that you actually use for your analyses. So we wanted to have a consistent, transparent and reproducible way of going from the raw data full of its errors and, consistency and inconsistencies through to the, the, the site level um, standard data we could then combine, combine with other sites across uh, Plant PopNet. Um, and we wanted to make that as reproducible and as transparent as possible. So that meant um, uh, writing scripts, basically scripting every single change that we make to any raw data and before it gets turned into a standard data product. And ideally, we could just feed in data sets at the start of these scripts and bum, 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 all the errors would be fixed and you get a clean data set at the bottom. Um, it doesn't quite work that um, automatically. There is a human in the loop quite often. There is always something the human has to do um, to, to get it to run. It's, it's not as simple as um, just fixing all possible errors. But we found, we found almost all possible errors, I think, at this point, and we've been fairly exhaustive. Um, as people start to use the standard data products, you might be curious around why something has a particular value or what was done to clean that particular column. And that will all be available for you in the, the data cleaning script. So you'll be able to go back to the script and see what decisions we made and how the data were cleaned. And if you disagree with um, those decisions and how the data were cleaned, you can take a version of that script, you can change it, you can fork it if you use GitHub, you can change it, modify it according to your uh, needs and your decisions and report that in the method section of your paper. So people can understand how your standard data product differs for, or your data product differs from our Plant PopNet standard data products. So um, I think that will help us in going forward and trying to, to, to understand and keep track of the changes that people are making to our, to our data sets. It also saves time for future projects. If there's a pre-clean done on everything, then um, every new project doesn't have to start from the raw data and go through the onerous data cleaning steps that we've gone through. Um, we can make the, the cleaning process reproducible and updatable. I think I've already explained that. And we can um, assess the impact of changes in the data. So if you produce two data products from the same data, raw data, but you make slightly different decisions around cleaning, um, you can figure out what impact that has on the final analysis by comparing the performance of those two data sets. So I think that's a very useful um, aspect as well. So it's taken a very long time. Um, I'm not going to apologize for that. It's, it's, it's been hard work. Alan has done the heavy lifting here. Um, but also we, um, we kind of um, crowdsourced the uh, data cleaning scripts amongst several members of the lab. 
um, over a period of 12 to 18 months. Um, so several of us contributed to the, to those data cleaning scripts. Um, and I'd just like to, to thank everyone who was involved because it was a, an absolutely Herculean task. Okay, so the future of Plant PopNet. Um, I think it's, it's fairly bright. We've got a pipeline of papers, which you'll see from the inventory of abstracts. As in every scientific endeavor, um, some things that you set out to do at the start worked and are great and exceeded our expectations and produced something fantastic. Um, other things turned out to be harder than we thought and they're still going on and they still need time to, to, um, to work through. And some other things just didn't work or were abandoned for various other reasons. And we've tried to keep track of all that on the inventory. And do send us updates. If you see something in the inventory and you say, actually, that's not right, it's progressed, or that's not right, it hasn't stopped, I'm still working on it, then send us those, um, those updates and we'll, we'll fix that on the inventory. Um, we're continuing to uh, clean the data. We have a nice working script now. Um, we've produced the year zero to year three standard data products and we'll continue to work our way through. Alan will continue to work his way through year four, year five, year six, and, and so on as more data sets get um, submitted to the network. Um, I think that our original 10 year data collection goal is, is actually quite achievable. And um, when we started, we'd be, we, you know, I remember writing a grant and saying, I think I can get 30 sites um, and uh, actually that grant was knocked back because they didn't believe me. They said they didn't think it was possible to get 30 sites. So we have more, a lot more than 30 sites now. Um, and actually we'll, we'll get a, a big pulse of new sites into, into the network as well. Once Maud has finished with her Plant Albrecht uh, project, um, those sites will be migrated over to the Plant PopNet data set as well. So that's another um, 15 or so sites that aren't currently in the data set. So, and we, we were already up to, to seven years um, data collection for some sites. Um, so we're getting there in three, four, five years time, we're going to have that decade long uh, data collection goal across a really wide range of different sites. So that's an amazing, that will be an amazing achievement. And I think we're on track to get there. Uh, funding for data curation is assured until the end of 2021. Um, which is around year eight data collection for some sites. Um, the process for data cleaning is now largely automated, but it still does need a curator to organize files, run scripts, be the human in the loop when the scripts break, um, when they throw up an error that you have to intervene on, um, and to make those standard data products available. So that's um, a reasonably large job. Um, we can give you time estimates if you're interested in how long that takes. And we'll know by April 2022 if we need an alternative plan for funding the data curation. Um, but we can start working on plan Bs for that right now um, uh, at this workshop. Um, so I need to also gauge, I guess, the appetite from you, from the participants for ongoing data collection. Are you willing to, to keep going and, and try and get to that 10 year uh, collection goal? Um, or do you feel we have enough already? Um, I guess the signals we're getting from site abandonment is we're starting to, to get sites being abandoned a bit more in the last two years, largely pandemic related, which is totally understandable. And if you've had to abandon a site for any reason at all um, over, over the time course, um, that doesn't mean you stop becoming, you, you stop being a plant popnet participant. Everyone still remains a participant, um, of course, and every time their data gets used, they get invited to author papers. So, um, uh, whether you contributed one year, five years or seven years, you know, you're, you're still a participant. Um, so how long do you want to carry on for is a question. And I think we, we, we might want to have a discussion around that. Um, and then there's this, this, this open idea of, of what are the additional questions we can ask um, in order to use the existing data as fully as possible. And one of the reasons for making the, the standard data products available to you, the participants, is um, to help you to see what the data look like and help you imagine what the possibilities are for using those data to ask and answer really interesting science questions. So I hope you do have a look at the, at the standard data products just to, just to see what's there. So then this week, um, from Tuesday to Thursday, um, what are our aims? Well, there's, there's uh, the aim to update everybody on what's going on and then have really in-depth discussions on progress. So that's the science, governance, data and future that I've outlined here. And our 
breakout sessions will be structured around those themes. Um, we would like to hear about um, uh, contributions uh, from par participants to ongoing papers. So we'd love to hear about how the science is going, you know, for, for those abstracts which you're working on at the moment. And I'm sure participants would love to ask questions uh, to the speakers who, who, who kindly provided videos for our conference this week, um, as well as asking each other questions around um, abstracts or, or things that they know that, that other, other participants are involved in. So uh, we want to facilitate those discussions around science as much as possible. Um, it would be great to hear your ideas around progressing analyses and models um for current projects and future projects and new ideas and new opportunities to work with the data very welcome to talk about those and suggest new things for us to do um, and then ideally um as we go through you know these discussion sessions we end up with a strengthened network people get to know each other a bit more um, ideas get get thrown around people and um, find other people to collaborate with on interesting topics so that's a really important part of what we're doing as well so just to, um, I'm getting close to wrapping up now, is just talk about the structure of what we're doing uh, this week. So on Tuesday at 9 p.m., so all these times here are Dublin times, so please translate into the, the time zone of your choice. Um, we're inviting everyone to come to the very first session on Tuesday at 9 p.m., which is uh, where you can ask the speakers uh, questions about their videos. Um, so that this will, I hope, be largely a science session. So we talk about, um, you know, ask questions around the science that's presented and um, ask questions around some of the add ons that are proposed where the science isn't complete yet, but you can input ideas or questions to the speakers. Um, and that's only an hour. So I hope you, you'll all come along to that. Um, I know the time is slightly awkward for some people, but it was the, the best time we could find where everybody had a reasonable chance of being awake. And then we um, have two breakout sessions. So you are invited to come to one of the breakout one sessions and one of the breakout two sessions. We've provided each breakout session with two alternative times. So Wednesday at 7 a.m., which we think might be best for Australia, New Zealand and East Asia, uh, people in those locations, or come to Wednesday at 4 p.m., which is best for Europe, North America and Africa uh, and those time zones. Um, and then the same choice then for breakout two, you can either come to the 7 a.m. session or come to the 4 p.m. session. The idea is that we start conversations in breakout one and then we continue those conversations in breakout two. But if you prefer, you can mix and match. You can go to a 7 a.m. session one day and a 4 p.m. session another day. I, that's absolutely fine. Um, you'll get to meet more and different people that way. Um, and don't feel like you have to go to the Australia session if you're an Australian. Um, you're very welcome to come to the European session if you're still awake. So um, it's entirely up to you guys how you want to mix and match. But the idea is that we have two parallel streams going on. Um, one early morning stream and one afternoon stream. Um, so please don't feel like you have to come to all four of those. I will be at all four of those because I'm glutton for punishment and I want to hear what everybody has to say. Um, but um, you only have to go to two of those. And then our final session is again, all of us together um, where we kind of come together. We think about the future of Plant PopNet. Hopefully there's been some nice ideas come out of the breakout session. So we'll try and synthesize those um, and just have a final wrap up discussion. Now these sessions, um, the red sessions there are an hour long um, uh, scheduled and the uh, blue and purple sessions are two hours long. Um, but they'll go on uh, for shorter if, if people you know, uh, run out of ideas and run out of steam earlier, they, they might um, go on for shorter than that. But that's entirely up to how excited and enthusiastic we all are. Um, and I'm sure you will be. Um, okay, so that's it from me. I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all live online um, at the various sessions um, starting on Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Bye.